Welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted Post Lambeth 2022. This is episode 752. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's August 9th, 2022. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. You, if you're some of the 20% of the new audience that joined us in the last two weeks, please subscribe to the show. If you really, really like the show, uh, if you ever see it on YouTube or Facebook, click the like button. That helps the algorithms um, at Facebook and YouTube know that this is a show people like and helps grow the audience. Our audience has grown 20% over two weeks. So I, I know you're out there. Stick around. There's a lot more news than just Lambeth News. The Anglican Communion, in all its glory, is something that produces news 365 days a year, except for August. Most August, George and I basically take off and record every other week because there's not a lot of news except for Indian corruption stories and uh, new forest gardens around some castle in uh, the Church of Lingen. So uh, we're, we're glad you're here. Stick around. There, there's a lot going on. But this is a recovery show. This is the I just got back from Lambeth and what am I going to tell my friends type show. This is Kevin and George summing up what happened at Lambeth 2022 and kind of giving you the inside scoop as well as some of the behind the scenes. Um, George, have you recovered? Absolutely. i basically going to start singing Karen Carpenter songs right now. I'm on top of the world. Uh, seriously, I feel fantastic. Uh, it's been a great day. I've been on the phone overseas talking to some people involved in the conference. I've already had one worship service. I had two prayer counseling sessions. I'm going to talk to you, Kevin, and then I'm going to write some articles, then go back out in the road and visit uh, people in nursing homes. It's a there is no better life than mine. I hate to tell you folks that, but you should envy me because I have such a wonderful life. There's no better life than being a parish priest. I got to tell you, it's a fantastic way to be and to live. As a person called to the laity, I, I disagree completely. I think being in the laity is the best job ever, and uh, it, it's the way to live. But, you know, that George and I have different calls and all this. Thank God. Because I could not do what George does, and George would not be a good IT person. That, that's the way it works. <laughs> Just, no, 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 no. All right. I, I keep coming home with magic beans instead of transistor <laughs> chips or whatever. <laughs> Let's move on to our show notes. Um, uh, as I talked about, a typical August show here on Unscripted is boring. We're actually going to start with corrections. You said you had some corrections you want to make. Let's start with those, George. Yeah, one of the things we like is if we if we misstate a fact, other than just a you know a, a silly slip of the tongue, mm -hmm. uh, we'd like to hear from people to correct us. And I've got two corrections from uh, this past show. The first is uh, I mentioned Jenny Andes a Anderson. She is a, a former Suffolk Bishop in Toronto, and I described her as being conservative. Well, the Jenny Anderson I knew uh, going back a few years was a conservative people from uh, Toronto have written to me saying that was then, it's not now. Okay. She's part and parcel of the Canadian <clears throat> machinery. And the second is, I said there was a single woman conservative bishop in the Church of England. And it was pointed out to me, no, that's not correct. I mentioned Jill Duff, who's a right. suffragan in uh, Lancaster, in the north, northern the province of York. And it was pointed out to me, and I knew this, but I just wasn't thinking, that Ruth Bush Yeager, who is the Bishop of Horsham in the Diocese of Chichester, is also a conservative. I'm uh, not familiar as with we her. In the United yeah. She is fairly new, but okay. uh, her father-in-law is a priest in the Diocese of Pittsburgh. Hmm. Uh, this Anglican Diocese of Pittsburgh, I think. Um, or, well, whatever. Or I think he's retired, actually. <laughs> he's retired, so... <clears throat> But the, the point is, I misspoke saying it was one. There was only one. There were two, and I don't know the souls of all the rest of them, but there may be more. But there are two who I can firmly identify as being on the good guy's side. So, in hundreds of hours of reporting, of hundreds of stories, we got two corrections. That's not bad, George. Yeah, 
not bad at all. Let's talk about the Global South. They issued a, a communique, and uh, it's lengthy. It's good to go through, uh, discuss the communique, and kind of what we think about the communique, George. Uh, lay out for us the communique. Uh, you, you can read it. It's 18 pages, and you can read it on the, the Anglican Inc. website. Mm -hmm. and I, I'll put a link here in the show notes for people you know this was released on the Thursday of the last week of the Lambeth conference <coughs> excuse me and it was much of it was prepared before the conference and during the conference Ranesh Panaya the Bishop of Singapore and Keith Sinclair who is a bishop in the Church of England and also the head of the Church of England Evangelical Council uh, basically were the drafting redrafting committee to bring it to the primates global south primates for approval and they did this and it was released on the thursday of the last week of lambeth and it is worth your reading because it lays out in very clear crisp clean detail what the global south thinks and is going to do uh, the first thing is that the Global South says that those who have broken the Lambeth 110 uh, teaching on human sexuality are false teachers. This is a term from the Bible. Uh, yes. This is a term, it's not like George and Kevin <clears throat> misstating someone is a conservator when they're liberal. Uh, they're calling the majority of the American Episcopal Church and the Canadian Church false teachers. They're teaching a gospel foreign to Jesus Christ. Which is something Jesus warned us about. Jesus said many mm -hmm. things, but in each gospel he warned us about false teachers. Wow. And, and they describe themselves as having been formed in response to the actions of the Episcopal Church and the Canadian Church and other churches. In other words, they do not see themselves as being a truth and righteousness squad to police others. But they see themselves as being a reaction to the heresies, false teachings, departure from the Orthodox Christian faith that the Episcopal Church's majority of bishops have adopted. And their response is that they need to fireproof their provinces meaning they need to set up a break, a fire break to say this is right and this is wrong. And not only are they being defensive in the sense that we're not going to allow this, these false teachings to corrupt and destroy us, we're also going to continue to propagate the gospel and work with people in the Episcopal Church and in uh, the uh, Canadian Church and the Ang Church of England and so on and so forth. Um, to share the good news of Jesus Christ and to hold fast to the faith once laid out by the saints. And I think what to me is most striking is that they say, we do not agree that we are walking together. This was the big song. This was the big song that Justin Welby was singing at the Lambeth Conference, mm -hmm. that we can agree to disagree that human sexuality is eta aphora, a second order issue. It's not a salvation issue. The Global South primates say, no, it's not. It is a primary issue because it is foundational because we as Anglicans are not, are a doctrinal church. We draw a doctrine from the prayer book, the ordinal, the homilies, the 39 articles of religion, but we draw most specifically from scripture. And when the innovators depart from the clear teaching of Scripture, the 2,000-year tradition of the Church on these ethical and moral points, then we have to say, no, we're not going along. The uh, same-sex marriage is not a day after, are they right? Uh, paragraph 5.5, uh, the actions of the Episcopal Church and others, and I'll quote, undermine the clear clarity and authority of Holy Scripture. Now, folks, this, this, is, this is strong language. If you sort of compare it to Justin Welby's uh, words during the conference of sort of fuzz and bother and, and fudge is one English expression for it. They're really pushing hard back. Um, 
But then they go into their sixth paragraph, their sixth topic area, and say, we're not leaving. You're not going to force us out. We're going to continue to fellowship. We're going to continue in the Anglican way. We love the Anglican way. We are not ready to dump it just because we've got some bad apples in the in the uh, in the pile. But what we are going to do is have uh, mutual accountability, and that not uh, what we mean by that is that we will bond together with other like-minded Anglicans and we will not be bonding with those who have broken God's laws. So there will be various forms of impaired communion. And this further goes on to say that we are now no longer an Anglican communion. We're not a communion. A communion has a shared theological, doctrinal, moral basis. That's not true anymore. We're a federation of churches. All I can think of is Star Trek and the Federation. Yeah, no, 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 the Federation's <laughs> fine. Because <laughs> we have the Klingons over here in America, and we got the, uh, well, well, go on, go on. <laughs> and they wind up their statement by saying, in light of the Archbishop of Canterbury's decision not to exercise leadership, we are going to ask our fellow primates when we gather to review the role of the Archbishop of Canterbury in all of this. So here, let's go through. They're breaking fellowship to one degree or another with the liberals. They no longer see the Anglican Communion as an Anglican Communion. It's over, it's done. It's an Anglican Federation, it's an Anglican Fellowship. We are going to continue the Anglican Communion though, but we are going to be in covenant with those who are of like theological mind. Now, I'm not talking Anglo-Catholics and Evangelicals. Well, but the word covenant we've discussed before, you know, five, ten years ago, are you talking about a, a document or just in covenant with? Well, th that, that gets a little deeper, but mm -hmm. th for those who aren't following what we're saying, Rowan Williams proposed about ten years ago an Anglican covenant that we would all sign on to. And this was shot down by the liberal churches because the liberal churches says our our independence is greater than our interdependence mm -hmm. um and they didn't want to lose their autonomy you know something like so a covenant so here, here, here's yeah. the, the global south fellowship has basically said justin you're done the end communion as it now stands is over we are going to not walk together. Don't use that language. Uh, we may be on the same street, but we're walking in different directions. And our uh, mast, our flag is nailed to the mast of the Bible. Not uh, God is not doing something new with human sexuality in the actions of same-sex marriage. What is happening is Satan has invaded the church and is these are false teachers who are teaching doctrine unknown to the saints would they be saying after this lambeth that the archbishop of canterbury is a false teacher no because justin welby is very politic and very uh lawyerly he's never once said what he said thinks rather he's expressed what he thinks other people think um, or he says, I don't have an answer for that. Yes. Or I don't want to answer that. Right. Or I'm unable to answer that. Yeah. Now, friends, none of this is new. In, uh, when was it? I'm trying to think. 1988, the 1988 Lambeth Conference. Robert Runcie, the Archbishop of Canterbury, made in his, uh, what was it called? The truth, shall you, the truth Shall Set You Free. I had to write it down. Uh, he said in 1988, the Anglican Communion must make significant choices, moral choices of what is right and what is wrong, otherwise will fade into, into uh, oblivion or break apart. And his theme was dependence, uh, independence and interdependence. And he says, interdependence is the biblical virtue that we're called to. 
that and this is something that we get from you know frank griswold and all this and that that i can't be fully christian without you as well and what was happening was it was a perversion of what was coming out of lambeth 88 which meant, which was used by the liberals to say, we must allow these people to be part of the show because we're not fully Christian if we don't have them part of the team. And what Runcie was talking about was that before we act, we must basically get the consensus of our peers on these issues that change the church's teaching on um, and it's not just uh, human sexuality, the diocese of Oxford recently has added a fifth uh, call to the baptismal thing. Um, in other words, it's changed the traditional four-part baptismal liturgy to a fifth part where we promise to preserve and help creation, mm -hmm. you know, trees, greeny yeah. weenies. Now, that baptism is still with water and the Holy Spirit, but they're adding more clauses to it. Now that uh, and that was just done by the bishop. How is one bishop in one diocese able, without you know input from the province or input from the wider Anglican world, able to change the central tenets of belief? This is what the Global South is saying, that these people have no authority, uh, spiritual authority. Certainly they have political authority, but the church is not a political entity. Deep down, it is a spiritual one. I would think the West would argue the most important part of being an Anglican is our autonomy. Our, you know, independence, our ability to be independent provinces and independent dioceses. I would say that's our greatest weakness, is that holding up the, uh, the, the autonomy uh, flag and say, you can't tell us what to do, is actually unbiblical, unspiritual. We do this as one body. I think it was Rowan Williams in 2002 who said exactly what you were doing, saying, Kevin. Rowan Williams was one of the authors of the statement criticizing Lambeth 98. He was Bishop of Monmouth in Wales at the time. He was opposed to it, but he prized the communion Catholicity he subordinated his desire for autonomy to have blessings of same-sex unions in the name of wider Anglican Catholicity. He was a liberal, and at that time there were a number of liberals who put aside their desire for change in order to foster the unity of the church. Now what happened after that was that we had the Episcopal Church kept going and going and going. And the GAFCON movement formed. And GAFCON essentially broke fellowship with the Episcopal Church. Essentially, it's no different now from the Global South. Mm -hmm. The difference is the global, uh, if you can sort of imagine this, if you will, uh, uh, on a plotting board, we have basically four corners. And in this end, in the the, the conservative Catholics, ca small c, not Anglo-Catholics, but those who uphold the traditional standards of human sexuality, but also prize the unity of the church. And they're liberals who support the unity of the church, but uh, reject Lambeth 110. In other words, they reject it, but they're not moving to violate it. Mm -hmm. Then on the bottom side, we have liberals who reject it and who go ahead and violate it. And then uh, we have conservatives who reject the Catholicity and are fully independent and go and uh, accept 110. We do not have somebody in that lower right-hand corner. Those are the continuing church groups, if you will. Uh, those who reject the Catholicity of the Anglican world and are their own little freestanding group and hold traditional moral teachings. The GAFCON group formed uh, in response to the actions of the Episcopal Church, but from the very beginning, GAFCON has preached the covenant doctrine. We act together in unity. We seek to be interdependent with one another. They're, they've just been ahead of the curve the, from the global south. So at this stage, there's really no meaningful difference 
if if we had another run at a global Anglican covenant, I'm very confident. And if it weren't totally whacked out, <laughs> kooky, totally whacked out. <laughs> I'm very confident the Nigerians, Rwandans, and Ugandans would be on side saying, "Yes, we believe this. It, it's time for it." Now, now, but if I may just finally go ahead. finish for Justin Welby, his goal is unity. Above all, he has no theological underpinnings other than he sees unity as the best of all. And if you look at this plotting board, the conservatives who are sort of independent minded have already gone out with GAFCON and are fellowshipping amongst themselves. He's not going to bring them back. So the only people that he can basically, and then we have the Episcopal side, th USA threatening and doing all this and that. And so what Welby does is mollifies the left because he knows the global south are not going anywhere. And, and so that's why we see Welby moving in that liberal direction, because he can count on the global south. And this is what has been the fiasco for Lambeth, for Justin Welby, is that the global south has said, we're not buying this crap that we're walking together anymore. Well, Justin Welby said in one of his uh, speeches that he will not uh, hold the Episcopal Church of Canada accountable for the same-sex marriage and things. He's not kicking them out of the, the pool, basically. And I'm like, okay, that's one issue. What happens, you know, in 10 years if the Episcopal Church gets more innovative and, and they deny the Trinity? Would he get that? Would a Justin Welby uh, take on a province that denies the Trinity? Or some other uh, function or uh, quito function of the of the church. What is where is Justin L Welby's limit switch on this? Well, I don't know, but I can tell you the steps that I see coming. One is uh, there's a push in certain quarters to remove the idea of an age of consent. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, just as a, a general convention said a three year old the, the last last month general convention said a three-year-old should not be hindered from choosing to change genders and that could include surgery and this and that that's following by a call to remove the idea of an age of consent which of course opens the door for all sorts of evils now at the same time we have this push towards recognizing polyamorous relationships in other words uh, Adam and Eve and Steve and Fred and Bill and Jane and Mary as one marital unit. We have people uh, in seminaries, Union Theological Seminary, I think was doing this work. There's a seminary up in Boston uh, that's, you know, experimenting with liturgies to bless couples or thruples or whatever they call themselves. These are the steps we're going to go down. And the Trinity... Uh, is essentially meaningless at this stage to people like that because you know god is god is no longer father son holy spirit he's a creator sustainer sustainer redeemer he's oh. the, the three parts of the trinity are functional and if the function doesn't fit they'll change it again and again, I, and again. I would say that uh, the God of the Episcopal Church has caught, become the God of the Force. You know, may the Force be with you. Uh, it, it is what I see happening here uh, in theological terms in the seminaries. It's not the the God of the Trinity. It's not certainly uh, a recognition of the the usefulness of the Holy Spirit, the divinity of Jesus. Um, it, it's really a mess, George. It's not pantheism, it's panentheism that we see coming out of the Episcopal world. Mm -hmm. And this uh, uh, is very frightening, it's very difficult. And the Global South is building a fire break against the spreading into their room. I want well, to uh, respond uh, to uh, another uh, comment uh, well, on I, I want to go right there, because this is the biggest part of a fire break. How do the Global South, and GAFCON for that matter, stop the financial influence of the Episcopal Church from slowly picking away at the firebreak, at this firewall. 
Well, it's it's a uh, multi multi part answer to the question. First, there are global South bishops who have been and who are crooked, corrupt, and there will always be people who are on the payroll of whoever pays the uh, piper calls the tune. Um, the uh, what's his name Porter the uh, David Porter the Archbishop of Canterbury's chief of staff mm -hmm. uh, attacked verbally uh, one of the GSFA Global South uh, leaders uh, not a primate but a bishop and basically said look you're not going to get the votes here too many of the Global South people to take our money and they're not going to cross us because they know who pays the bills mm -hmm. now this takes us back to the chicken dinner accusations of barbara harris in 1998 lambeth in 1998 the liberals said and loudly by barbara harris the only reason why africans voted in line with conservative americans and australians was that they were provided with chicken dinners and watermelon uh, yeah she, water she, she went the whole way all right so. Yes, as, as if this were if as if this were Newark, New Jersey, and a Democratic ward leader came out and was handing out money, walking about money to get out the vote. Um, that mindset is still in the liberal wing. Well, but it is. Will it work? So, somebody and will work, work with some. I want to talk about a, a email that was forwarded to us uh, with some images of a conversation that was going on between a bishop of Western Variety, we'll say Episcopal, and a bishop of uh, Global South Variety, Africa. And he was talking about, you know, I, I'm here as a liberal bishop, and I know how I can influence this guy. And we had a great conversation at dinner, and I can influence this guy with money. And that's the gist of this conversation we got over Facebook. And the Episcopal bishop was bragging about this person he met and bragging about the fact that you know in, in five maybe ten years you know, he'll be on our side because we have money well there will always yeah we joke about Indian corruption mm -hmm. that India is part of the global south they're going to be bishops who are crooked uh, there are some Tanzanian bishops who are crooks I mean they're not every province is going to be clean and it's one of the things about GAFCON is that uh, they've been able, they're basically the cleanest of the bunch, just about, uh, just about. in uh, south, of the, south of the Sahara. Uganda, for instance, is very, uh, very hard on uh, internal uh, corruption and bad. But what I wanted to say is that it, if money buys votes, then explain to me why 50 South Sudan, South Sudan and Mozambique are the two largest groups who've already signed the Global South Statements. And South Sudan and Mozambique are the two poorest Anglican countries in the world, provinces mm -hmm. in the world. And every single South Sudanese bishop and every single Mozambique and Angolan bishop signed up. Mozambique and Angola have had a relationship with the Diocese of London for 20, 30 years. That doesn't stop them from standing up for the gospel. I wanted to mention, people have written to me and say, well, George, if the Global South said X, how come they don't, haven't done this? Why aren't there more signatures? Because on uh, the 7th of August, they released saying, so far, we have 125 bishops from 21 provinces who have signed the 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 affirmation why not all 275 global south bishops at the lambeth conference why not well it's very easy to explain first off you have to understand how this thing arose just you know the global south on third on the first thursday of the lambeth conference wanted to meet with justin welby he said okay we'll meet friday morning and they told him we want to get five minutes on monday to explain what we're after a statement asking for reaffirmation of Lambeth 110. This meeting was pushed back from Friday morning to Friday afternoon to Saturday morning. Then it was finally pushed back to 4.30 on Saturday afternoon. And that's after the British papers put, are put to bed for Sunday. Mm -hmm. And finally, Justin Welby agreed to meet them. 
And when Welby met with the primates, and there were other people besides Justin Welby in the room, there were aides for both sides. Justin Welby began by berating these Global South bishops and berating their English staff leaders for being tools of GAFCON, paid agents of GAFCON, who were seeking to disrupt and wreck the conference and the communion. Uh, that Justin Welby can be a petty tyrant. Uh, he's noted for his uh, peremptory and abrupt style with uh, with subordinates, and he we was treating. We, we have heard stories that we are not going to forward uh, to our audience, but yes, he has a, a reputation uh, externally and internally in the Church of England, George. Yeah, and uh, just like he. Uh, and he'll lose his temper, just like he called you and me, what, 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 ah, son of a bitches right. or bastards or Some like that. whatever. Okay. Yeah. Some of that. Um, uh, to some primates. He went off on this uh, jag about uh, the Global South being the paid agents of GAFCON, and GAFCON is the devil incarnate because they're not walking together. Well, the Global South Bishop basically laughed, said, we got nothing to do with GAFCON. We haven't talked to them. We are, I mean, we've talked to them in like Counts Kappa meetings, African province meetings, but there's no grand strategy of GAFCON uh, basically uh, looking to torpedo the Lambeth Conference. We have our own concerns. And Justin Welby sort of pulled back and then sort of uh, basically gave hell to his uh, chief of staff and his press guy because they basically have been feeding them this line. Welby was fed this line of this great uh, manipulative conspiracy out there. And this is all part of like my being, uh, my being hit up by people trying to pressure me ecclesiastically. Okay. They have the meeting. Welby responds with, well, I'll write a letter. And We'll talk about the other stuff. And we mentioned the past, Welby changed it so that we can't, we don't know who's here. We won't tell other anybody who's here. We won't record votes. Um, the Wi-Fi at the, Lamb at the Lambeth University of Kent was, was dreadful 10 years ago. <laughs> it was worse now. It, yeah. <laughs> it's dreadful today. Yeah. And Welby pushed it off, finally gave them the letter, was unacceptable. They couldn't agree, and so all of the promises, both sides, went their own way. So no separate worship room, no list of people, no list of votes, no uh, five minutes to talk about this. And Justin Welby went ahead and put out his letter and then gave his speech where he basically changed the goalposts where the gay movement is now within the good graces of the Anglican world. Um, which And... So the next day, it's Wednesday, the London day. So on, so basically the first time that the Global South can basically advertise this statement to the people at the conference is Thursday. And the conference essentially ends the next few days. Yeah, yeah. And they announce on Friday that after two days, they've got 125 votes. Um, now, you need to look at this in detail. They weren't given the list of who was there, so they don't know who to ask. They were not given an opportunity to canvas. They're not, you know, there was no meetings or side groups or anything like that. And for instance, uh, the West Indies and West Af and uh, West Africa and Central Africa are missing from the list of signatories. Well, they're very conservative. They're going to sign, but they basically probably wanted to get together as a group and have them all sign it or nobody sign it. Um, only two of Myanmar's bishops have signed it. Well, the primate of Myanmar is one of the Global South leaders. They've probably not had a chance to get together. The Archbishop of Bangladesh is one of the signatories of the original communique, but he hasn't yet gotten around to signing the statement, or none of the other Bangladeshi bishops have. What is interesting to me is that eight Episcopal bishops and three Church of England bishops and three Irish bishops and some Canadian bishops have signed up to this. Now, they're keeping the names quiet for now, so as to avoid retribution. English bishops are not supposed to make statements on this while they're still doing this living and loving faith process. 
We need to be continually restudying and restudying the issue. And if you sign this, you're basically saying, I've made a decision, I'm no longer taking part in the LLF process. So Welby is, you know, closing off doors like that. But the Global South, this is an ongoing process. They're going to sort of, when they get home, when they get organized, they're going to start asking individuals and provinces, please sign up. And they're going to go to Nigeria and Kenya and, and, and Rwanda and uh, Uganda and all these places and say, would you please add your name? And would you, do you endorse this as bishops? So we'll, we'll get there to the 75% you know, mark that they, uh, 75, 80% mark of maybe up to 90% mark of Anglicans in the world supporting it. So we had the Global South put out their communique. Lo and behold, the Liberals also put out a communique, George. Uh, certainly, uh, you got time on your hands over at Lambeth. You sit down, you, you put words on a paragraph, and presiding Bishop Michael Curry did so with uh, some people over here in Canada and North America. It says quite a bit different things in the Global South, George. Yeah, uh, five primates came out with a uh, letter of their own, a communique of their own, saying that they reject Lambeth 110 and they're going to go full steam ahead with gay bishops and gay blessings and all same-sex marriages and gay clergy and all that. So basically the opposite statement, that independence is the most important Anglican virtue, not interdependence. Interdependence was the watchword of the Global South. Independence was the watchword of the Liberals. And they put out their letter and they've got 175 signatories. Now people go, oh my goodness, that's more than the Global South. Yes and no, because you need to look at actually who signed it. Now, the five original primates were the usual suspects, Wales, Scotland, Brazil, Canada, the USA. They've, and of the signatories, 19 of 31 Canadian bishops, three quarters of the Episcopal bishops, all of the Anglican Episcopal bishops of Brazil, uh, one Mexican, Julio Martin, who's a Facebook friend of mine and who has been the one who if you read Anglican Inc., you know that a bishop in Mexico has been pushing for same-sex marriage. Uh, two Irish bishops, Colton and Burroughs, no surprise there. And two English bishops, uh, the Bishop of Buckingham and uh, David Hamid, the suffragan in Europe, two suffragan bishops, which is interesting because they're supposed to keep their mouths shut. And in the global, but there are essentially no global South signatories. Mexican, Julio Martin, well, Michael Lewis, a sixth primate, signed up. But Michael Lewis is English, and he's the Archbishop of Cyprus in the Gulf, which is an English expat diocese. And he's 70, and he's about to retire. So basically, he's now coming out and fully waving his flag. There are three South Africans who signed this. One, Margaret Virtue, is white. One, Raphael Hess, is what they used to call colored, mixed race. And only one non-white global South African has signed this, Vincentia Kabab, uh, Kab Kagabe. She is the Bishop of Lesotho and she was appointed as Bishop by the House of Bishops in South Africa. And she was the one that Justin Welby had to be this preacher on Sunday. And she's an academic. So you only have one, if I would say, two truly global South bishops Julio Martin and Vincentia Cagabe, plus the Brazilians who are have always been in that way. So it's a very, very uh, stark split. And the other thing you need to look at is I was looking through the list and I noticed some names from the good old days. Catherine Roskam, no, the suffering in New I York. See that, right? She signed it. Huh. And as did Wendell Gibbs, retired Bishop of Michigan, Arthur Williams, Franklin Brookhart of Montana, the Episcopal Church numbers are all sort of padded out by having retired bishops who uh, don't really count. So they're basically stretching the numbers a bit, but still three quarters of the Episcopal bishops signed up. 
I think it's great that eight Episcopal bishops signed the other statement. And uh, But they're keeping the name secret for now because they know that if they came out, those guys will have targets on their back. Oh, absolutely. They'll yeah. be Bill Loved. And, uh, uh, or we'll do the uh, Catherine Jeffords Shorey, Keith Ackerman. Oh, by the way, for being a good Anglo-Catholic, you've abandoned the communion of the Episcopal Church. Goodbye. A sad day. I remember that. But... You know all this. You know this is we've been. Get, I've been getting a little deep into the weeds, but Kevin, this is such a good time for the Anglican world because the distinctions and the divisions are so very clear. There's now no longer any illusion that the Archbishop of Canterbury is going to fix anything or do anything. Right. No salvation through Canterbury. But that, that is, uh, Justin Welby has established he won't and can't, and uh, there's some agreement that he can't. And there's full agreement that he won't. But we're in this point now where we have called out the other side as false prophets, as false teachers, as something that Jesus warned us would take the church down, would be the, the wolves in, in sheep's clothing. Whoa! I mean, it's no longer, hey, we're, we're going to have tea and talk about a hard issue. The issue has been talked about, decided, and now we're naming names. That's a bit different, George. It's very different, and this is a win-win-win for everybody, but for the people in the Church of England. I have to hate to say that. For instance, in the Episcopal Church, uh, the Global South has said, we want to work with the, uh, the diocese and individuals who want to be part of this Global South Fellowship. Mm -hmm. And we're going to move to change it from being a Canterbury-centric communion to being a doctrinal faith communion. Um, the Episcopal Church, you know, at our last general convention, uh, they voted to spend $20 million on race reparations and things like that. People say, oh, the Episcopal Church has got so much money. When the kooks are in charge, they spend it and it will bankrupt the national church. So, so that money is going to be gone within a generation. But meanwhile, and the people are fleeing the parishes, except... Uh, where they're not, and where they're not you know, are the parishes that are not following this path towards towards chaos and damnation. The most successful parishes in the Episcopal Church are the evangelical conservative tilting. Surprisingly, mm. there's these healthy churches that are completely apolitical, that don't take sides on anything and just serve as a wonderful parish, and sometimes a community and, parish. And those churches, whoa, they do well too. And to be fair, there are always going to be niche parishes like All Saints in Pasadena, which is hyper-liberal, hyper-affirming, and, and in the Los Angeles area, they can attract two to 3,000 people for their particular brand out of that when many people live in Los Angeles. Okay. Um, well, we're talking about the Episcopal Church. We're talking about general conventions. What happens at their next general convention? Did They haven't announced where the meeting yet, have they? Uh, no, uh, they went through this big song and dance and said, well, we can't meet in Florida because Governor DeSantis is an oh, evil person. Evil, evil, evil. Or, yeah. No, I'm sorry. We can't meet one after next in Florida, uh, but we'll meet in Louisville, Kentucky, even though Kentucky has the same abortion laws as Florida. Uh, they had a fight over that, but they said, no, nah, it's too late to jump. jump okay. So I think they're meeting in Louisville, Kentucky. So the Louisville con Convention, all the delegates are there the House of Bishops, laity, clergy, and somebody says, part of our schedule this time is to have a drag queen come and dance down the hallway and join us on the altar and explain what life is like for a drag queen. And then what happens, George? <laughs> And what's well, worse, after, it's already yeah, happened. It's, yeah, it's, it's happened, hasn't it's a, it? Right? Well, it, it happened in a, in a in a Episcopal school chapel, but oh, I'm thinking of some bishops, Kevin, who uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So, but I mean, where is the limit switch for the Episcopal Church? It doesn't exist. Yeah, you know, we talked before well, that the the Episcopal that, Church see, is proof of the slippery slope theory. Yes and no. Because somebody else, if you're a policeman and you're in a corrupt, crooked police department where a lot of the guys are on the take, mm -hmm. 
does that mean policing is wrong? Does that mean that you can't be a policeman anymore? Or do you just remain an honest policeman and do your job? Uh, the, uh, it's always a mistake to use broad terms like the Episcopal Church it says or does or thinks, because that's never true. The Episcopal Church is the totality of its membership and its people. The General Convention, a diocese, a bishop, a parish, those are, you can say that about, but for the Episcopal Church, you can't say that. So for me, it will never particularly matter uh, if there's a drag queen walking down the uh, aisle at General Convention, because that uh, my focus is not on the institution as the center of belief and loyalty, but on Jesus Christ. And just because these people have fallen away into apostasy, it's my job basically to teach the truth. But my condemning them and walking away from them doesn't do anything to bring them back from the edge. And one of the things that we are seeing gradually, individuals by individual, is bringing people back from that world and mindset. Gavin Ashenden was one of them. Gavin Ashenden was a pro-gay liberal until he saw the light. Yeah. And if there weren't there, if there weren't people within the Church of England who walked with him in that journey, who knows where he would be now? Well, that's the cool thing about the Global South. They recognize uh, North America as a mission field. Mm -hmm. That you know they're bringing a, a they're bringing the authentic gospel here, the Orthodox gospel here because it's not being taught. Uh, to the standard, it's, well, you know, certainly with the ACNA, but it's certainly not a standard within uh, North America anymore. But see, there's this fascination with bishops. People make a mistake that grammar determines doctrine. We're called the Episcopal Church, therefore right. everything must be Episcopal. The Episcopal Church got on just fine for 200 years without any bishops. They were all in London. Mm -hmm. And we just got on just fine in the United States. And until we had our own in, uh, you know, 200 years after the first church opened on the in mainland. Bishops, you know, I guess I've been long enough in the ministry to realize the bishops really don't mean a darn thing. They have no influence whatsoever, uh, except for hiring and bringing clergy into their diocese as gatekeepers. They really don't have any influence. What a bishop says only matters if you want it to matter if you're a parish priest. 99% of my congregation have no clue about the Lambeth Conference. It's totally irrelevant to their lives. Anything that, they, you know, the Lambeth Conference, uh, they had like 10 resolutions at the end where they did adopt statements. One with them put forth by the Episcopal Church on gun violence. Uh, that gun violence was the major issue facing the United States right now, according to Michael Curry. Do you think anybody cares do you think anybody would walk out of the my congregation because Michael Curry says gun violence is the major issue? No, nah, it's nonsense. People come to church because, or they should go to church, a healthy church, because they meet the living Lord Jesus Christ. And they either meet him or they don't. And it's that simple. And if they meet him in a denomination that is crazy at the top, but they know Christ in their congregation, it doesn't matter. I mean, look at the Catholic Church, for goodness sakes. There are powerful Catholic, you know, parishes, and there's some extraordinary, awful Catholic leaders. Yes, sir. All right, George, let's finish up the future. Okay, I have a number four mark on my little outline says the future of Anglicanism. And a lot of starkness came from this Lambeth Conference, good and bad, but now all the veil has gone the fabric has been torn the veil has gone we know who's who is on whose team what does the future purport for the Anglican communion especially because now uh we're months or weeks away from the church of england putting out their living love and faith statement um we're uh weeks away from uh more craziness happening here in north america uh, we're weeks and months away from uh, other conferences happening around the world, uh, GAFCON and Kigali, uh, maybe an Anglican conference coming up. Um, what does the future purport? Certainly, we know that independence is not something 
the majority of the Anglican Communion is going to support in the future? Well, first off, several answers to that. We're, demography is destiny. Mm -hmm. uh, in time, there will be no Anglican Church of Canada. There will be no Episcopal Church. There will be no Church of England, as it stands or, or right Ireland. now. Because yeah. or Ireland. Not completely, of course. Yeah. But the lib that there's a great emptying of churches. But there's also great filling of churches in other other names, other guises, or in other parts of the Church of England or the Episcopal Church. There's a filling, and it, it's just, you know, the demography is going to make one lesson. The money is going to run out another. You know, this Lambeth Conference called upon the church committers to pay reparations for West Indian slave trade, and they may just be silly enough to do that. Um, they spend tens of million dollars of on evangelism that produces no works. Why not give it away in another form? Sure. What's the long term? What's the long term focus? The long term focus is glorious. Now the church will always struggle, always fight, but there is a remnant within the Anglican world. However, and you cannot say it's the global south because, yeah, as we show on this church uh, on this show, there are a lot of crooked bishops in the global south. There are a lot of. Uh, I don't want to say a lot, not certainly not the majority, but there are more than enough to wipe away any illusions that the Global South is perfect or the GAFCON is perfect. But Christ's word continues. Churches that are faithful continue to grow. Lives are changed one by one. And the form and some of the practical things are the Archbishop of Canterbury will be dethroned as the leader of the Anglican world. Probably the Church of England will eventually enter, have a third province because Canterbury and York can't accommodate the traditionalists. And they'll basically, I think that may be on the cards in the future. Not this, not this general synod, but I think it's on the way. The Episcopal Church will continue to decline. We'll see amalgamations of dioceses. Uh, we'll see the House of Bishops fall in half in numbers. But parishes like mine will continue to prosper with act with whether who whoever is bishop in Orlando or whoever is presiding bishop in New York or not. Um, the box, you know, Donald Trump has a little phrase he uses: "Shaking the box." If you've got basically a mess around you, let's shake the box with the dice in it and throw it again and see what comes out. And some people call this creative uh, destruction, chaos. But out of this, God is still going to arise and his word is going to be preached and people's lives will be changed. Um, I, I just see uh, good arising out of all this trouble because there's no longer an excuse to be a cultural Episcopalian. Indeed. <laughs> or a cultural Anglican, for that matter. Uh, you know, uh, I am an optimist. I always uh, think any uh, situation is redeemable until your last breath. And I don't think the Anglican Communion has taken its last breath. I do think this is going to be a wonderful time where in the next dozen years we can separate the wheat from the chaff. That we can identify and say, this is who we are creedally. This is who we are doctrinally as an Anglican communion and this is important to the majority of Anglicans that we believe and hold to these truths and it's also important to us as Anglicans that we identify the false teachers then that we identify false teachings and I think that's that's going to be the new Anglican communion not one where we're dependent upon Canterbury not one where we're dependent on the instruments of unity but one where we're dependent upon our faith our doctrines and our beliefs and um, our future. We're dependent upon our future. And I think the final, not maybe not the final, but a point that I wanted to make is that mm -hmm. it is the laity who will rescue the church from apostasy. Mm -hmm. It's not bishops. It's not people like me. Just as in the time of the Arian heresies, uh, it was the lay people when the majority of bishops went round the bend. There were only a few bishops, Athanasius, who stood firm, it was really the laity who restored the church to the true faith. 
uh, for me as an Episcopalian, one of the orders of ministry are the laity. Uh, so it's not a stretch to see that theologically. But historically, that's how it's always been. Mm -hmm. It's the laity who pull off the fat out of the fire for us. And I think we're going to move into a time when that's even more true. So get busy, people. Uh, hey, what can I do? Well, I'm glad you asked, as a viewer of the program. Pray. We are called to pray for those who we're friends with and for those who are enemies. Uh, George and I start every Anglican Unscripted by praying uh, for each other, for our families, for the show, that God would not let us speak our own agenda, that his agenda would uh, flow through us, and that we would be light and salt upon this earth. Because I, having seen a lot of the journalism that covered Lambeth, I, I was losing hope. There were a lot of stories there that I'm just... Where do they come up with these, George? Um, I, I'm glad. Well, they're, 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 no, they're no real, uh, that's unkind of me to say, but uh, religious journalism, at least in the British press, is no longer it's especially, it's, yeah. it's, you know, it's one of the stepping stones you make up. You know, you start off with community reporting, then you do the ladies page, and then you do religion, and finally get to the real stuff. So these are young kids who really have no clue what they're talking about yeah, it, doing the reporting these days. It was a stark understanding that any understanding of uh, Christianity or thesis or anything like that is gone. You know, there's not even a general understanding of what Christians believe among secular press. So, hey, why don't we let them know what we believe? All right, that's episode. Well, that's your job. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 752 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>